So before we begin, I hope you watch the short little clip on the intro to ecology to see why or when I had to read this originally. I also hope you watch the short little video on the book, The Sand County Almanac, that introduces some of the writing of Aldo Leopold, why his writing is so important in the field of ecology and wildlife management, and how this short story came about. Before you begin, I want you on your assignment sheet to just write down why you think the author use the title thinking like a mountain so based on what you know about nature why do you think the author used that title we're going to go over some vocabulary there's some words we really don't use anymore or um, are uh, used in a different way than usual and so we're going to go over each each one of these words first we're going to start with a loud bow this is what a loud, unrestrained shout sounds like. This is what the author is talking about. Now, just imagine hearing that echoing from rim rock to rim rock. So a rim rock is right where the arrows are pointing. Um, if you saw the uh, Pixar show Cars, right? That kind of looks like some of the topography in that in that movie. So the wolf would howl, it would echo from rim rock to rim rock. He's going to talk about a coyote and a promise of gleanings. Well, this woman here in this picture is actually picking up gleanings. It's to gather grain, but he's not talking about the grain. Grain is cut by uh, a sickle. It's a reaping machine or a reaping machine. So here's a reaper that you might know of. That's the Grim Reaper. Okay, so that's how people used to harvest wheat and the picking up off the ground was called gleanings. Well, he uses it in a different way that we'll see. When we're talking about red ink, to the cow man, a threat of red ink at the bank. Well, red ink comes from um, a deficit, a loss. So you might have heard of uh, it was a Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, where everyone goes shopping. Well, the reason they call it Black Friday is that's the day where many businesses are finally in the plus, in the black, right? Up until then, they're running at a deficit and they're in the red. And I think the term comes from the way that books used to be kept. I, I don't know if red ink or red tape is a Civil War term but it's an accounting term. A pyro is a beginner or a novice, but in this story, he talks about an uneducatable pyro. And he's talking about when we're in the presence of wolves, if you can't understand um, what that sense is like, you kind of have a problem. So you're kind of like the ostrich that's sticking its head in the ground. So an uneducatable pyro, is a dunce, basically. I think I, well, when we used to read this in class when we were in virtual school, I would talk about when I was in Alaska and we were in grizzly bear country. When you're in grizzly bear country, um, you're aware of every little thing, every little sound, every little move, because um, it might be a grizzly bear. So um, that's what he's talking about, same presence that you feel when you're in wolf country. He'll talk about a turbulent river elbowed its way, right? So that's a turbulent river and elbowing, right? It's making a bend, a sharp bend. We'll talk about a doe, which is a female deer, fording the torrent. Well, fording is just a way of wading across a body of water. A torrent is just basically rapid water, water rushing. So it was hitting the deer so hard, her breast, her chest was a wash with white water. He uses two terms, pretty interesting. Melee, which is a struggle, and maulings, which is physical abuse. But he uses them in a positive way, a welcoming melee and playful maulings. And he's talking about mama wolf and her pups. 
right? So wolves and puppies can be a little bit violent in a sense. Um, and it looks like a melee and maulings, but they're actually having fun. They're learning some lessons. He uses the term extirpate, which means to wipe out. We would probably say exterminate today. He's referring to the 1920s policy that allowed governments to exterminate the wolves um, from pretty much the whole United States, but definitely wiped them out in Yellowstone. So that's kind of what he's talking about, that policy. And he's talking, he uses the word anemic, just the British version of the British spelling of it. So you guys should remember anemia when we were learning about blood and red blood cells and hemoglobin, how it carries oxygen. Well, if you don't have a lot of hemoglobin or you're low on red blood cells, you're going to be tired because you don't have a lot of oxygen. So this person, he's talking about a forest being anemic, right? Pretty interesting metaphor there. Um, and if you remember sickle cell anemia, right, same factor. So when the forest was anemic, it's an anemic destitute. So it's a tired looking forest. Destitute is something that you don't use anymore. So the forest is just so abused, it's not worth using. He speaks about a dictum and he quotes Thoreau. A dictum is just a noteworthy statement. The statement in here is going to be in wilderness is the salvation of the world. So Thoreau was a pretty interesting guy. He um, went off in the wilderness. He was a philosopher, poet, right? The industrial age was kind of kicking in. Humans have kind of removed themselves from nature. And Thoreau went back into nature and he wrote this book. Um, he wrote many books, but this is the book that he's really noted for, Walden or A Life in the Woods. So he took off and he lived two years in this is a replica of the house that he lived in. It's this same house that's in the book cover, kind of small. And he just found simplicity, happiness and simplicity, happiness in nature. And that's what it means by in wildness is the salvation of the world. So here's where it's interesting. Um, in the past, students kind of took offense and you'll see for the use of the word dullness in this story, but he's actually talking about simplicity, kind of what Thoreau was looking for, kind of peace, right? A lot of us just kind of like things simple. Your mind is kind of innocent, like the simple farmer, not like the uneducatable Tyro, but just a really humble person that finds joy in just simple things. There are simple things in life. Okay, so that's the vocabulary. So now we're gonna start reading, thinking like a mountain. If you don't wanna follow along, you can go and there is a PDF of the short story posted on Google Classroom. But I'm gonna start reading now. Here's just a copy that I own from when I was in college. A deep chesty bow echoes from rim rock to rim rock, rolls down the mountain and fades into the far blackness of the night. It is an outburst of wild defiant sorrow and of contempt for all the adversities of the world. Every living thing, and perhaps many a dead one as well, heeds heed to that call. To the deer, it is a reminder of the way of all flesh. To the pine, a forecast of midnight scuffles and of blood upon the snow. To the coyote, a promise of gleanings to come. To the cowman, a threat of red ink at the bank. To the hunter, a challenge of fang against bullet. Yet behind these obvious and immediate hopes and fears, there lies a deeper meaning, known only to the mountain itself. Only the mountain 
has lived long enough to listen objectively to the howl of a wolf. Those unable to decipher the hidden meaning know nevertheless that it is there for it is felt in all wolf country and distinguishes that country from all other land. It tingles in the spine of all who hear wolves by night or who scan their tracks by day. Even without sight or sound of wolf, it is explicit in a hundred small events. The midnight whinny of a pack horse the rattle of rolling rocks, the bound of a fleeing deer, the way shadows lie under the spruce. Only the ineducatable Tyro can fail to sense the presence or absence of wolves or the fact that mountains have a secret opinion about them. My own conviction on this score dates from the day I saw a wolf die. We were eating lunch on a high rim rock at the foot of which a turbulent river elbowed its way. We saw what we thought was a doe fording the torrent, her breast awash in white water. When she climbed the bank towards us and shook her tail, we realized our error. It was a wolf. A half dozen others, eventually grown pups, sprang from the willows and all joined in welcome in a welcoming melee of wagging tails and playful maulings. It was literally a pile of wolves. What was literally a pile of wolves wreathed and tumbled in the center of an open flat at the foot of our rim rock. In those days, we never heard of passing up a chance to kill a wolf. In a second, we were pumping lead into the pack, but with more excitement than accuracy. How to aim the steep downhill shot is always confusing. When our rifles were empty, the old wolf was down and a pup was dragging a leg into impassable slide rocks. We reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then and have known ever since that there was something new in me, in those eyes, something known only to her and to the mountain. I was young then and full of trigger itch. I thought because fewer deer, I'm sorry, because of fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green light die, I sense that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. Since then, I have lived to see state by state extirpate its wolves. I have watched the face of many a newly wolfless mountain and seen the south facing slopes wrinkle with a maze of new deer trails. I have seen each edible bush and seedling browsed first to anemic destitude and then to death. I have seen every edible tree defoliated to the height of a saddle horn. Such a mountain looks as if someone had given God a new pruning shear and forbidden him all other exercise. In the end, the starved bones of the hope for deer herd, dead of its own too much, bleached with the bones of the dead sage, were molding under the high line universe. It is now, I now suspect that just as the deer herd lives in mortal fear of the wolf, so does a mountain live in moral fear of its deer, and perhaps with better cause, for while a buck pulled down by wolves can be replaced in two or three years, a range pulled down 
by too many deer may fail of replacement in as many decades. So as with cows, the cowman has, the cowman who cleans his range of wolves does not realize that he is taking over the wolf's job of trimming the herd to fit the range. He has not learned to think of a mountain. Hence, we have dust bowls and rivers washing the future into the sea. We all strive for safety, prosperity, comfort, long life, and dullness. Deer strives with his supple legs, the cowman with trap and poison, the statesman with pen. Most of us with machines, votes, and dollars, but it all comes to the same thing. Peace in our time. A measure of success in this is all well enough and perhaps a requisite to objective thinking, but too much safety seems to yield only danger in the long run. Perhaps this is behind the rose dictum. In wildness is the salvation of the world. Perhaps this is the hidden meaning of the howl of the wolf, long known among mountains, but seldom perceived among men.